So I got my start working in disk forensics about five years ago, four years ago, I don't know. And um, for the last year and a half, I've been working on memory forensics. Uh, and malware is kind of a newer field to me. Before I was doing more um, like task focused, just figure out what this artifact is. Um, so yeah, uh, this is my presentation. It's gonna be on hunting fileless malware with tree sitter. Uh, this is my first B-Sides and my first time talking at a B-Sides, so uh, let's go. <laughs> so what I've been working on kind of as a pet project is writing a tool that can both detect and deobfuscate trees that, I mean, um, PowerShell scripts that have been put through an obfuscation tool. Um, and I've been using the tree setter library to do that. Is anybody familiar with that? Anybody heard of it? A few? So um, I'm going to give you all some insight into what that is and why it's so useful. Uh, tree setter was originally developed for the Atom text editor. It is a tool that can take a grammar for a programming language that you write in JavaScript and convert, it converts it into JSON and then into a really fast C parser. And once that is done, it provides you with an API for accessing elements of the tree and also for uh, running queries against the tree. Um, for a while, this wasn't something that I looked really far into. It was kind of just like some thing that is part of NeoVim these days, and I was like, I don't know what this is, I don't know if it's worth the time to learn it, I'm just gonna put it on the side. Until I was on YouTube one day. Um, and I watched this video um, by this guy, TJ DeVries, who explained how you can use this tool to uh, basically do syntax highlighting on SQL embedded in your source code if it's inside of like, for instance, a raw string literal in Rust. And I was like, this is really cool. Uh, I wanna have this as part of my development workflow. So I, I spent the time figuring out how to use it. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, there's many language grammars out there for all kinds of programming languages that are pretty well supported. Um, if it's a common programming language, it probably has a really awesome grammar for it. And even some of the lesser known ones uh, have support. Language nerds love the right grammars. Yeah, thank God for them. Uh, there's, yeah, let's see. So kind of the most, the power feature of tree sitter is these uh, queries. So you can write what are called S expressions. If anybody's ever used Lisp or Scheme, you're probably familiar with those. But they allow you to express um, as a kind of data structure uh, what you're looking for. Um, so this is kind of what I wanted to achieve, which is where my SQL is highlighted as SQL inside of Python, which is highlighted as Python. Because that's just really fun. Um, you can also like grab that part of the document out shell it out to like a formatter and have your SQL formatted for you and re-inject it into your documents. So as a developer, it's just really handy um, and satisfying. So this is what this looks like in, um, in NeoVim. There's a, actually a built-in tree inspector. So once you get your language grammar properly set up and installed, you can in command mode run the inspect tree command. And on the left will pop up this little window where you can navigate through your source code as a syntax tree. And if you press O from within that panel, it'll open a window on the top where you can uh, experiment with queries. In this case, this query is looking for an assignment statement where the left identifier is equal to the word foo, and it has been labeled statement. And the identifier has been labeled ID. That's what the little at symbols for. Those are called captures in, in tree setter. 
So uh, on the right side of my document, the word ID there on the far right is actually um, being produced from the query editor. It's saying, hey, I found your ID. It's right there. It's good. Here's another one that is like a little bit more complex. It has a couple of requirements. The first one is that the string on the left of a binary operation is equal to hello, and the string on the right matches world, W-O-R-L. Um, and that actually performs a regular expression match on the content of the node. So you can perform these like really nice targeted searches. And those are called uh, predicates, the things on the right. So how does this tie into PowerShell uh, obfuscation? So once I had um, learned how to use this tool and integrated it into my workflows in some pretty cool ways, uh, I was talking to my boss one day about enumerating commands that like, are run from bash scripts. And he was like, that's probably like, kind of a messy task. And I was like, well, maybe not. Like, if you have access to the syntax tree for a bash script, then you can just query for commands. And um, it would be like, pretty trivial to list all the commands that are run inside of a script. And I was like, OK. So if there's one for bash, I wonder if there's one for PowerShell. So Microsoft had produced a grammar for PowerShell that was being maintained by them for a while back, like five years or something. But it had kind of uh, been neglected and it was out of sync with the current tree setter library. You couldn't actually use the grammar. So I started looking through the forks and I noticed that the Airbus cert team had adopted it and was actively maintaining it. And I was like, aha, if, I, uh, if an incident response team is using this, then we can probably do some pretty interesting things with it. So I'm grateful that they have taken up the mantle of maintaining that. Since my kind of pet project is still in the early stages, I've really focused on using the info obfuscation library as kind of like my uh, test data generator. Um, and it's a well-known tool for obfuscating PowerShell scripts. It uses several different types of obfuscation. I won't cover every single one of them today, but there are some that are extremely common. So the first one is uh, token obfuscation. Um, there's three options on the menu when you run into a obfuscation for this. The first one injects backticks into the uh, command. The next one uses the command invocation operator on the left, which is the ampersand, and then concatenates the pieces inside of a pipeline and then evaluates it that way. And the third one, the third one uses format strings um, in a similar fashion with the invoke expression operator. Uh, and this is problematic for if you want to use traditional tools to um, search for bad things in a PowerShell script, like calls to virtual alloc or create process um, or any of the other many, many things, invoke web requests, things that you just like generally would want to know about. So um, yeah, to a traditional scanner, like it's hard to make sense of this, but uh, tree setter actually can pinpoint the exact location in a script where there's a command invocation expression. And here's an example of that. There's a um, library on GitHub called Tree Grabber that I kind of hacked in PowerShell support for. And it allows you to like grep files, but with tree, sh tree setter queries instead of uh, regular expressions or patterns. So in this case, it's running my Splat and Cat query that I put into a file because it's like, too big to put right there. But you can see that it actually spits out the exact part of the document that matches your tracer query, which is pretty cool.
There's also AST-based obfuscations. Um, a lot of these that I looked at don't actually impact your ability to detect or deobfuscate much. Um, with the ex one ex notable exception is the uh, set variable AST trick that you can see here, where instead of using a traditional variable assignment, it's done dynamically. So um, as you'll see later, you have to be kind of careful with that. But generally, reordering things doesn't matter in tree setter because uh, the S expressions are not sensitive to the order of operations necessarily. Like if you say, find me a command with an argument and the argument has like, you know, another argument to it, it doesn't really care that those are in the correct order. It's going to look at all the child nodes and see one that matches. Uh, this is an example of string obfuscation. Um, what this does is it puts the entire command into a string and again uses the invoke, op the invoke expression operator to run that command. And this one has a whole bunch of stuff done to it. It's uh, using environment variables, it is doing format strings, it's doing concatenation, casting from integers down to characters. So. The original script is basically unrecognizable in this instance. Uh, going back to those environment variables, you can see that they've scrambled, the, they've mixed the case, and they're indexing into it in order to produce the IEX alias, which is an alias for invoke expression, which allows you to run PowerShell from a string. Basically, take the string and convert it into a PowerShell runnable. Uh, Presetter, again, easily detects this because of the invoke, op invoke expression node type. And here's an, another example of those uh, typecast tricks where you make characters from integer literals. It's just another step to slow you down and make you have to um, manually analyze this. And there on the bottom is an example of uh, how tree setter queries can locate those exact locations in the document where a cast expression is taking place. So it's really doing a lot of the hard work for us of figuring out uh, the components of a PowerShell script and producing a useful interface for dealing with that. There is also compression in the uh, invoke obfuscation library, where it will like put everything into a compressed base64 blob and then uh, run it through this pipeline that decompresses it from a base64 stream and then uses, once again, invoke expression on the left from the, uh, the comspec environment variable. So detection is like really only a small part of the problem because analysts have to very carefully deobfuscate these detected scripts, find out what they did, what they might do, um, and then go from there. This can really slow you down if you don't have a good way to do it. Um, and time is precious when you're doing an incident response. Uh, these obfuscations are often layered on top of one another. So you might have a format string that gets split up into a concatenation operation, and it can just get very messy, even though it all evaluates down to the same exact PowerShell script. And there's really not great publicly available tooling for this that don't require you to run a sandbox, since you don't, just like running random PowerShell, you don't know what it's gonna do. So going back to TreeSitter, it was developed for code editors like uh, NeoVim and Atom. And there's an API for actually editing the tree. So um, you can take a node and say, hey, TreeSitter API, I would like to update this tree at this node with, the, with this text. And um, it will then re-parse re the entire tree, not the entire tree, 
it will reparse the tree, but only the ranges that you changed. So it's extremely fast, and that's how it's able to uh, update the syntax tree of a document on every single keystroke, is because it doesn't need to reparse the entire document. It only needs to reparse a single section of it. So what I did for my tool was I identified small atomic operations that I thought were reasonable to undo that were part of invoke obfuscation. So like casting an integer to a car, okay, I'm gonna edit the syntax tree and I'm going to convert that back down to a literal S. And then when I see two string operands on a concatenation operation, concatenate this back together. And you just run those in a loop until you stop getting matches on those kind of reducible operations. So this is a basic example of that. Um, IEX can be reduced back to IEX because we have no reason to keep strings separate and being added together like that. Um, you can do your type pass, format strings, back ticks can be stripped out, comments can be stripped out. Uh, you can, once you've done a lot of those things, start fixing the case on things. If you keep a, you know, just a hash map of, or a hash set of common um, PowerShell commands. Uh, you can rip, it, rip out comments. I've seen bad PowerShell scripts that have just like giant areas of comments to just be annoying and also uh, mess with signature analysis. So this is like kind of Microsoft's baseline for uh, detecting bad PowerShell. And I used string obfuscations on that to produce this nasty looking thing. And so here's my tool in action. It goes through it and you end up with pretty much the exact same thing that you started with. Um, and it actually runs much faster than that. I'm putting the thread to sleep between each individual iteration. And at the end, it will show you exactly what atomic operations were completed. In this case, nine format strings, 11 string literal pipelines, two cast expressions, and I missed the last one, uh, one string number usage. So this was an even bigger sample. And this was the, kind of the one that I kind of was working against as I was developing this. I was like, if I can get this like back to a usable, to a readable state, I'll be pretty happy with where I'm at. And lo and behold, after a lot of fighting with the Rust compiler and writing tree sitter queries and debugging them and all that stuff, um, I have something that can make this usable. Uh, you can see it works from front to back, kind of uh, going through each of those atomic operations, carrying out the edit, reparsing, re-editing. Another trick that I did with this particular script was um, handle the random variable names. Almost every sample I've looked at has like, just like randomized variables, which are extremely hard to like keep in your head. Like bz12xqp and like another variable name, something very similar. Uh, it's just like hard to keep track of mentally when you're analyzing something, even if you have to, even if you have like partially deobfuscated it. So, I added a layer that goes through the variables and uh, rem renames them with like this Docker container kind of <laughs> thing where Spike, okay, and I can see that in a document. I don't have to like think like BZ12, BZ12, like, no. And so this is the end result of the original test script. Uh, still has a couple things to figure out. The, one of the big challenges is uh, null variables in PowerShell. Um, you can actually use uninitialized variables in any operation and they will like evaluate to none. So when you like strip these things out, you have to be very careful that you're not deleting something that is actually initialized in a part of the script that you haven't deobfuscated yet. Uh, my thinking at this point is to just like 
wait until you've done all the other ones and then uh, get rid of any variable that looks like junk and then go again and see if you find anything else. So you can do some even more complex things with queries than just finding like these simple atomic elements. This sample has um, this kind of like script block launcher where it uses a stream reader from gzip stream from base64 text and uh, to make things worse it actually the base64 string on the inside has these format operations and concatenations and stuff applied to it so it's not as easy as copying and pasting this and uh, piping it into like base64 and then gun zip or something so this is the query that I <laughs> wrote for deobfuscating, for, or for locating these kinds of things right here. And it looks giant and nasty, but it actually wasn't too hard to develop because you can cut out parts of the syntax tree and then use those as the base of your queries. So I found a sample that looked like this. I snipped out the uh, part that was the launcher, and then I added conditions requiring that, for instance, the first command is equal to new object, uh, the second command is equal to, or the, or the object type is stream reader, uh, new object gzip stream, new object memory stream, and so on and so forth. And at the very bottom, sorry, tiny text, don't worry about it, is uh, <laughs> a requirement that it is a, actually a, string, a single string literal and not a whole bunch of other stuff glued together. So this can prevent it from attempting to unpack something like this until all the other operations have been carried out. Like this. So it goes through the internal part of the base64. Um, and then once it matches, it unpacks the payload, pipes it, or like sends it to GZIP, and uh, you get to see what the actual payload was. Another cool use case that I've been thinking about, um, and this is one I kind of just like hacked together at the last minute, is extracting binary payloads, especially for uh, PowerShell scripts that might be used to like inject shellcode into another process. You can write a query that looks for uh, byte arrays that have a, like, a fixed type of uh, variable in each one, and automatically pull it out, convert it to a, a vector, and then I put it through this simpler library just as a proof of, proof of concept here. So one of the great things about TreeSitter is error recovery, um, especially in memory forensics because we deal with so much data that has, is, an in, is in an imperfect state. Like we deal a lot with smear. Uh, things that come from memory might have like been truncated at a page boundary or just skewed in ways that are unexpected. Uh, tree Sitter handles errors extremely well. It just replaces the part of the tree that is missing or that it can't figure out with an error node and then it continues to try to reparse until it can find something that it makes sense of. So here's an example of that. On the tail end, we have this error node you can see there. Um, trying to run this with a traditional PowerShell interpreter, it complains about uh, a missing delimiter, but when we send the exact same script through tree sitter or through this tool really um, it can still handle it there's an error node in every single iteration of the syntax tree it doesn't care because it still has access to the rest of the tree and in the end you'll still end up with something uh, that you can understand so some another advantage of this is speed and portability uh, this is written in rust and c it's really fast it could be a lot faster even because I made a design decision at the beginning of this that uh, I didn't realize was going to have a performance impact, which is essentially costing me O of N on every single kind of query I want to execute instead of just like bundling them all together and running them all at once. So this handles 745 clean PowerShell scripts in 42 user seconds because this is threaded. Uh, and that would probably be likely closer to like four seconds if I had to guess. 
One of the big challenges with uh, the PowerShell grammar in particular is the complexity that it produces in some cases. Uh, in Python, array loops are very nice. Like, it's an array and then it has a bunch of items that are all like children of the array no of the array node. But in PowerShell, every array is actually either two unary expressions, like an int and an int, or it's an array which has an array subchild and a unary expression, and so forth. So you get this nasty recursive structure that makes it kind of hard to query against. Like, if you want to determine whether or not every single item in an array is an int, you can't do that with a simple query. But what you can do is query for the contents. You can grab a node of like the top level array, and then you can actually query a, within a single node in a second query. So you can um, kind of iterate on this. And there's a, an example of the, gra the actual grammar itself, and you can see it's a unary expression, an array literal expression, or a array literal or a unary expression. So that's why it produces that recursive structure. And that's it. Um, if anybody has questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me on any of the socials. And uh, if you thought this was cool and have thoughts on it, I'd love to hear. Have you made any of that open source on your GitHub, or is that all? Not yet. No. It's uh, there's like zero error handling. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I assume, uh, it looked, I assume it successfully generic across all of them. I'm, I'm sorry? Generic across the tools because you're not, you're not matching the specific classification tools. Actually, there's Have you found that that's successful? Uh, I still have to do more research. Um, but I, I do plan to audit all the major obfuscation tools. And that seems like it's Yeah. I would be willing to bet that most of them do these like string tricks and stuff like that in environment they variables. They don't actually use like organized stuff. They say you use stacks for I'm sorry? They use stacks for instance. They don't like check the uh, 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 u